get and something. You know, you can request notes of all of these sermons, and the idea behind a note is not to tell you what we want you to believe, is to share you the basic skeleton of the idea of what's being taught. So then you can go back in, see the notes, take it, study it, and let God speak to you personally. That's what we do. And when you're receiving good Bible teaching, remember there's four settings you have to keep the scripture in. Number one, you have to keep it in his historical setting. Don't take it out of his historic, who are they talking to? What was the date in which they were dealing with this? Second, you have to take it, don't take it out of context. You have to keep the scripture in its context. Don't pull a scripture here and a pull a scripture there and try to develop your life around that. That's not healthy. Now, I'm not putting you down. I'm just trying to tell you, good, healthy Bible studies, know the history, understand what the text was, what are they dealing with, understanding who to whom it is talking to, and then finally apply it to yourself. So you could be reading the scripture and then say, okay, Lord, that really doesn't do a whole lot for me, but how can I apply this to myself? When you do that, the Holy Spirit steps in and takes you on a journey because his job is to guide us into all truth. And I'd rather have him guiding than me stumbling into it. Say amen. Are you with me now? All right, we've been doing a series called Reigning in Life in Christ. It will turn out to be an entire year of weekly Bible studies with two weeks off. And so I make things like that so that people can take it home. They can teach it or at least study it and then be trained by it. The idea is you should catalog, if I can encourage you to journal your life. Write down what God's at least God has done each day in your life something special, something you can go back and reflect. You, have you heard that song, Count Your Blessings? Amen. And he says, but I can't count that high. Amen. So we're going to call this one the Believer's Report Card. Hello? We're going to call this sermon the Believer's Report Card. Now, uh oh, you know how report cards are. But folks, if you think it, the scripture tells us that at the end of it all, when God calls us home, we stand before Christ. Now, here's the, the wonderful thing. The only thing that's going to go up before God is your new creation. Can you say amen? Your body is going to have to be changed. If you're raptured, it'll all happen at once. Your body will be changed because of the corruption in your blood. And in your flesh, remember, that's what Adam gave us. That has to be stripped off. So if you read 1 Corinthians 15, it tells you that this corruption, your body, will put on God's incorruption. And this body of flesh will be swallowed up in life. So God will change your body. So you're not going to take this old shell with you. So try not to pamper it too much. Because it's never satisfied. Someone say amen. amen. All right, so the idea is that God wants us to relate to him spiritually and with our mind. He says, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. All right, so let's get into this. What is our, our report card? So as I go ahead and we're going to read our scripture, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And you'll have it up on the display there. And I'm going to read it for you. And it says, for we have... So for we know that if our earthly house, has talking about your flesh, this tent, notice he calls it a tent, temporary, is destroyed. We have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this, or in this knowing, we groan earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from above. We get a new body. Can you say amen? A renewed body. All right. And then it goes on. So we groan earnestly. Indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent, this body, groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but Further clothed that mortality, remember your flesh condition now, may be swallowed up by life. 
Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. See, so this is your right as a believer. Who also has given us the spirit is a guarantee. So here's something that I, I don't know how many Christians really know this, but when you said, Jesus, come into my heart, God put a seal in your soul, on your forehead, that said you belong to God. Did you know that? And the Bible says that our name then reappears in the Lamb's book of life. Here's a, here's a nugget for you. When was our name put in the Lamb's book of life? Not when we got born again. Before the foundation of this world, God saw all of us in Adam and purposed for us to live before him in love. We know Adam gave that up. And the sad thing about it is, is you and I were in Adam when he gave that up. Wow. That means, so we got the curse that Adam passed along into the physical realm. So let me describe it. This is for the new people that are watching. We have so many new people coming in and watching the broadcast. Now listen, when a person is born in the earth, they're alive to God. Their body has a curse in it, but it's still too young for it to keep people, a little child from fellowshipping with God. So listen, a young child that's born is automatically born alive before God. But they have to grow up in this body that has a curse in it. And this curse works and shuts a child off. At, we call it the age of accountability. That's when they know right from wrong, right from wrong. You can go back in your past if you can remember like that. And you'll find out when you really started sassing and disobeying and all that kind of stuff is when you severed from God and your flesh took over. That's why we must become born again. A person actually must confess that Jesus is Lord, accept him to come into their heart, listen, and forgive them of their sins. Once they ask him in, you are accepted totally, just the way you are. And then God says, come on, I'll work with us. I'll work with all of us. I'll work with you, and I'll take you into a walk that will blow your mind. Now, the problem with a lot of us is we want to lead our own walk. We want to run our own life. Now, I'm not putting any of that down. It's just naturally. We want to be able to have freedom of choice. God gave us all of that. But I choose Jesus. I choose his wisdom. I choose to have my mind set on things above. Why? So that when I encounter a trial or a problem, I have his wisdom to deal with it. Say amen, somebody. And that's who you are. You are that person. So it says, listen. We groan within ourselves to be clothed with this natural, un, this supernatural body. Now, verse 6 says, so we are always confident knowing that while we are, now this is, has a double meaning, I'll explain. While we are at home in our body, we are absent from the Lord. Now, people take this as death. To be dead means that because you're saved, you're died, your body went, you went right direct, your spirit and and so on, right to heaven. As soon as at death, you're a Christian, boop, you're there. But your body remains here. Goes either in the grave or cremated, doesn't matter. There's no such, God knows where every little molecule is. So, boom, amen. So you need to understand that while we're at home in our flesh, another word for body there is flesh, while we're so up and, and into what we're doing, we're not as aware of God as we should be. Come on, can I have an amen? amen? All right. And when we are thinking about God and dwelling on God, we're more aware of him. Now, God doesn't leave us. It's we become less and more aware by placing our mind and attention on. And God's, I'm going to do this for BJ. God told us to focus, slow down and focus and catch his the rhythm of the spirit so we don't get ahead of God or fall behind. I, I, I hate to turn my back on you, but that, that's kind of like what happens. But your family. So as we go into this, I want to explain just a little bit more. So we're always confident that while we are just at home in our body, we're absent from being aware of God. It's just the way it works because this body's not going. 
This body does work against us. Come on, you've gotten up one morning and you weren't feeling well. You had to have a talk with your body. Come in line. Come on. You see, it's a different entity. All three of you are one package, but your body is the lesser of all and should be given the less attention, just enough to keep it maintained, healthy, and whole. Say amen. So he goes on. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether we are present or absent, whether we're walking around obeying God in the natural or whether we are aware of God, whether we have died and been present with God or whether we are still on this earth, we make it our aim to be pleasing to him. Say amen. Say, I want to be pleasing to God. All right, so let's go ahead. We're going to cover these four areas. If you're taking notes, or at least you got the notes, follow down, it says, let's see. So we're going to cover this area, hopefully, and give you enough balance to understand. We be fruitful, live before God in love. God wants us fruitful and live before him in love. I'll show you where the scripture is. That's his purpose and plan, and that still is his purpose and plan. Now, whether we are distracted away from that kind of life, or we feel like we have been not given that ability to live that kind of life, let me tell you, that's a deception. Because this world is not our home. Amen. We're passing through. So you can't get too attached to the physical realm. Because we were meant to be with God in eternity. And this planet was never meant to be in the condition that it's in it. It fell also with Adam and has a curse in it. It's even tilted, and we had, God had to bring a moon here to keep us, keep this planet going because something happened, we'll talk about it if you want, over lunch, that caused a great curse upon this planet as well as the fall of Adam. We'll get into it. I think Christians need to study a whole lot more, but you know what? I'm finding a lot of them have forgotten how to apply the word properly. You know, God has a safe place for us. Do you believe God has a safe place for you? Hello? Do you believe your heavenly father has gone and sent his son to literally put everything and set everything up just for you? Yes, he did. And he went through hell and back to do it. And that's how much he prizes you. So we need to literally understand that our father had lost us and now we have come home. Now he wants to show us the treasures and the mysteries of the kingdom. Are we going to be concentrating and consistent enough or are we going to be thrown to the wind so we can't get much that's our choice I always make prepare, preparation for the word and for prayer because I know those are my strengths in Christ amen all right so we are to be fruitful and live before God in love say amen Two, give Jesus away to those who are lost Everywhere you go, have tracks, some way to share your testimony. Why? Because believe it or not, just doing that, God has extra grace for you. I know people that their lives are atrocious, but every, every day they share Jesus. And you know, I mean their life's atrocious because you're not applying the word and things are breaking apart. And you have to apply the word to get the word's promises. But their life was still blessed because what were they doing? They were sharing Jesus. And so the Bible says give Jesus away, but also give him away by our witness and the way we behave. And then thirdly, we're going to cover live and walk in the spirit. We're just going to cover that briefly. We've been covering that a lot because there are a lot of Christians, and listen if you can gracefully to me, there's a lot of lovely, wonderful Christians that are living for Jesus naturally. What I mean is, they're working hard, they're, they're trying to keep in prayer, they're doing all this, now listen, but they're doing it in the natural realm. We wear out that way. The Bible doesn't say live for Jesus only, it says let Jesus live through you. So when we get up in the morning, present ourselves to God, we let Jesus lead us, and we live through him. That is our strength. Oh, yeah, we have a lot of want-tos and we should-tos and all that, but that's just mind games. No, get up, 
present yourself to God, say it's you and me, God, you're leading, and just enjoy his protection and that, and don't start taking it and, and be moved. There's so many Christians moved by impulses and the, the wants and the needs of everybody. Remember one thing, we're not Jesus. Therefore, we can't answer everybody's problems or questions. I can't be there all the time for you. I wish it could. But you know what? I can pray. And you can pray too. So make sure you got that real strong prayer life. I mean, real strong. Because a week when in the last days, it's not going to make it. You'll be chipped up and spit out. There's more devils that loosed in this planet than ever before because of humans inviting them in. We're talking about unsaved humans practicing the occult. So Christians need to rise up. You need to learn how to fight and launch Jesus bombs into the occults and split them up, send confusion into their camps. If you want to learn that stuff, ah, I cut my teeth on that. I think the church has been uh, dazzled and browsled, and all we have done is created a giant circus. Lots of noise and excitement and everything, but nobody's getting any word. I'm concerned because it's what we do in the word that causes us to be blessed. We'll see that in a moment. And then fourthly, we'll cover this. We belong to Christ and we are set apart for him. Folks, a lot of Christians, and I'm just speaking generally, date Jesus. They're dating Jesus. Good thing. But there comes the day when you need to marry him. Do you know what I mean? When I was dating Linda, oh man, I was on the phone, we were texting, we're doing all that, you know, all this, that, blah, 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 blah. And that's where a lot of Christians are. But again, the God requires us certain things that requires us to be mature, pay attention, and do some things. And that's when we marry him. You see, when I was dating, I could just have my life and date her and just, you know, doing that kind of thing. But when I married her, I can't just say, honey, I'm not coming home. I'm going fishing for two weeks. Well, that's nonsense, Pastor Kerry. No, Christians do it all the time. Oh, Lord, I love you. And then they, God never hears from you all week long until you're in trouble. You're dating Jesus. Surrender and marry him. Find out what he desires for you, and you'll find out it'll be the greatest life you've ever lived because he's in charge of it. He's never lost a battle. He's never been frustrated. That's why the Bible in the New Testament tells us to learn to master walking and living in the spirit. Why? Because Satan can't go in the spirit realm. He's locked out. He can't go into the throne room of God. He's been thrown out. He can't go where we are. We are in Christ, hidden in God. So therefore, we are in a tank. He's out there looking for us to be deceived, hoping that we're going to lust for something else so he can lure us out of the tank. Now, I want to tell you, a good, strong, prayerful Christian is so solidly blessed in that tank it would take a Hiroshima to get them out of there. But Christians that are compromised and loose living, and they just do whatever they want to do, they get out of there all the time because they think they can live the world and they live with Jesus at the same time. You cannot. That's the deception. We're going to find out about that. So I hope you're excited because we're all going to get a report card. How you did in Jesus. So if you know that, then you're just going to do good in Jesus, right? Say amen. First point, be fruitful. God wants us fruitful. Live before God in love. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Look at this scripture. These are a wonderful introduction to this book. Some great teaching comes out of this book. In verse uh, 3 through 6, Ephesians 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has, past tense, blessed us with every spiritual blessing. Where? In heavenly places. Now, the Bible tells us to set our mind on things above. 
So don't let your mind worry. Don't let your mind be occupied with those things because it darkens your ability to hear God's clarity in his word. So don't hold on to things that you can't really deal with. You have to keep them in God's hands. Let him deal with them. He's not limited like our mind is. Say, oh me. Now listen. Then he says, with every spiritual blessing, but we have to be in a higher realm. How do we get in a higher realm? Set our mind on things above. And just as he chose us, see, we didn't choose him. He chose us first. Chose us in him where, listen to the next phrase, before the foundation of the world. Before this planet was even created, God saw Chantel, God saw Larry, God saw Barbara, God saw Peggy, God saw Brenton, little Colin, families that we have. We were there with God. That was God's always his purpose is us to be not dealing with the devil, not dealing with a cursed planet. This was not his plan. This is what Adam did. And now we are under that curse, so the only way out is in Jesus. Say amen. Now, I always like to tell people this, that it's time for us to sober up as the body of Christ. This world, this world, because of its system up and for a time, is a prison. What do you mean? Nobody really, if you think about it, we teach and preach the gospel. Nobody can leave here without Jesus in their heart. Now, the devil can't leave here because he can't get saved. And all his little cohorts can't either. So they want the world. So they're working hard. Have you heard of the tribulation? That's when the devil gets in a man and he tries to control the world. The devil wants this world. He's still trying to take it. And he's trying to take your world from you too. But we need to learn to walk the way Jesus wants to walk. And in the blessings, but first we need to understand that it was never God's will for us to experience this. And so because we are thrown in it, let's sober up about it. Hey, if you're somehow in another country behind enemy lines, I don't think it's a good time for you to be a big mouth. Be quiet, be still, listen to God so you can get out of there. Why are we so spiritually ignorant? When you're under attack, be still. Trust God. Cast every care over on the Lord and just love God because God will move you right out out of it. But if we get to talking and rapping and yapping, 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 we get to catching on things and it holds us into that situation way too long. Say, oh me. That's the way things are. Satan has all this world, the world, not the earth, all the world's full of traps and turning people against each other. Listen, we're not going to agree on everything, but you know what? I agree to disagree, but I'm not going to fight amongst my brethren. One of the things we warn people, and this is another one, never criticize another Christian. Just leave him alone and say, Lord, I don't understand them, but I ask you to bless them and make sure their lives are right. When we start talking like that, we're actually cursing and chipping away of our own life. Jesus said it, every word you shall speak, you will answer for. Let it all be good. Everyone say, let it all be good. Don't be talking negative all the time. Talk Jesus. Say amen. You know what I mean. I'm, I'm not saying you can't go into the job and preach Jesus, but you can live him. Can you say amen? All right. So look what it says. And it says, we should be holy. The word holy there means set apart. God is just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be set apart and without blame before him in love. And everyone right now, good luck, but that's how he purposed us. Having predestinated, this is what he chose for us, to the adoption as sons by Jesus Christ. 
He saw they blow it the first time. I'm sending my son Jesus. Now they have to choose him. If they choose them, then I'll totally accept them and I'll start working on their family. The gospel rescue plan of redemption is very simple. Reach people for the Lord. Get the seed of Christ in them. Turn them over to God and let God work in them. But what, is, what has the Lord done? He's gotten everybody involved in everybody's life. And we're all trying to straighten each other out. And we forgot about souls being saved and people evangelizing. I need some evangelists to go help canvas this area and tell them about this wonderful church. Hello. And so do other churches. The, the church in the church has been way church too much. They've got too much knowledge and not enough doing. And so churches have to become doers and not sitters and metamorphosers, professional students of the word. Yes, we always learn, but we also have to match a little hearing with the doing. Can you say amen? A little doing with the hearing. All right, go to my next scripture. What does it say in John 15? We've just picked out a little bit. Be fruitful, okay? And we're going to just pick out three through five, seven through eight. For you're already clean because of the word that you just heard. I read that it's a God predestined you to be before him in love. So he still looks for your love. He still gives us love. It's unconditional. Can you say amen? And if we get up and walk with Jesus, we'll get a better life. How will we? Because we'll believe the word. God will fight for us. He will protect us. He'll bless us. But we have to stick with it. Stick to it. Stay consistent. And most Christians are not consistent about pretty much everything. Except for complaining. I'm just joking. We need to be consistent. You don't just have a prayer life whenever you want to pray. You be consistent. It's set a time where you and God meet consistently. Watch the change happen. Yeah, pray anytime you need, every time you want. But still, you have to have a face-to-face -face time. Let me explain. I, if I closed my eyes, I'd be aware. Boy, I, I do not like this. I got to find a way, better way with this mic. It just catches everything. And it's just not. Maybe I should have you tape me up before service, dear. That's funny. I, let's say if I close my eyes, I'm still aware of you. Right? But it isn't until I get down and, and I look at somebody face to face that it really means something. We're aware of God. He's everywhere present. That is not prayer. That's just you're in God, you're before God. Being aware to God is saying, God, I come to you in Jesus' name to address him. And now you're face to face. Very important. That's where he transfer his life into your life and where you give the cares and the things that hold you back unto him. We call it the great exchange before the throne of God. Come boldly before the throne of grace that you may obtain help in a time of need. Say amen. So he says, look, you've heard the word now. You already clean through the word that he has spoken. Abide in me, stay in me, be consistent in me, and let me be consistent in leading you. As a branch cannot bear forth fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. So, Christians by profession or Christians by fruit. Fruit. Remember the story, Jesus went to the fig tree and he sought fruit on the fig tree, but all he saw was leaves. A quick lesson to learn. Don't be just all mouth and no do. You have to be a doer. You have to be very good because you're receiving a report card. What's the report card do? How you love God and how you love people. That's the only two things God's concerned about. How you love yourself, forget it. Way down on the line. Come on, laugh with me. How you love God and how you love people. That's your main concern. Because the more you love God, the more God gives you his wisdom, his knowledge. He equips you to reach people. We don't love people in our love. You've got to read the word love. God speaks. God was moved with compassion. 
move with love. It's a special word for that love, which means it's a supernatural love that goes beyond what you see or hear. You love people beyond their fault, and you bring them out of themselves to Christ. You don't attack them. You don't tell them you're sinners. You say, look, you got a lonely heart. Would you like to know some more of this that I'm talking? Yeah. You make them drip with envy and desire to know what you know. So know something. Say, Mark, laugh. Learn something. I went to schools. I teach schools. You want to go to a prayer school? I have one, all prepared. Now I'm looking for students. Want to come? It's free. The only thing we can get, now this is a joke. Please don't take it. The only thing you can get when, when Christians have bands like concerts and potlucks, then that's where you get the people. Preach the word and they're running everywhere. Ah, la, la. No, laugh with me. We need to be serious. It's the end times. So God needs you. Say amen. All right, so if you're going to produce fruit, you have to abide in God. Verse 7 is one of my favorites. And John 15, 7 says, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will. Now, you, if that happens, you're not going to ask for weird things. You'll ask and heavens will move. Jesus said, the works that I do, shall I, you do also. One of the works was prayer. The disciples came to Jesus and said, we want to know why you're so powerful. Teach us how to pray. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. You will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. And by this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit. Last week, we learned about the tree. So shall you be my disciples. A couple of points. God has made the way, Jesus, for us to walk in him. We must become good at following him. A lot of us are good at making our own choices, and some of them are wrong. And we've gone on adventures. Turn your life daily. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. Lord, take the reins right now. Fill me, get me equipped, make all the adjustments in me, Lord, and I just worship you and I thank you. As I get up from here, I'm following Jesus. Now, you'll go through your same routine, but Jesus will be at the head of it. And he'll give you joy in it. And he'll show you the fruit of it. Can you say amen? Secondly, there are in the New Testament two commands for us to follow. We, we shared them with you. To love God and to love people. Now, the word for love there means to love God with his return. Now, I have to explain this. God filled us in our heart with Jesus, didn't he? Do you have Jesus in your heart? God is love, so you have love in your heart. But here's the key. You have to turn Jesus and let Jesus lead you to love someone. We're not talking about physically. We're talking about to love them to heal. Jesus was moved with that love, that compassion, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. So he was moved to meet need. All the people had to do is just come to Jesus. Boom. Well, you know, you're an extension of Jesus. He lives in you. You don't give them just food. You don't give them physical medicines only. But what we do have, Jesus, learn to give him out. Say amen. Learn to share him. Don't try to convince people. Share the love they'll pick up because every human being has something in them when they hear God coming out of another human or they hear God for themselves goes off. So learn to speak God. Learn to talk out with God. You see, that's where the anointing is. Amen. We'll talk about that sometime a little later. Thirdly, if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, we should also love the way Jesus loved and give his only begotten son out too. Say amen. How about all your, your family? Do they know you are a Jesus freak? Oh, they, they won't talk to me. Write them a letter. Give them a call. Tell you I love you. 
Don't let that stuff intimidate, intimidate you. I mean, my goodness. First people that came to me about Jesus, I was in, my, in Prairie Ridge in my folks' house because I was still kind of a teenager, kind of a smart aleck guy, a failure. About 23 years old, just before I got married, still living at the folks' house. Now, I'm not putting anything down. I'm just me. And some wonderful Christian Baptists came to the, to the doorstep. And they had their two little children and a, and a young wife. And I had just gotten stoned. And, and so they knocked on the door, and they wouldn't stop knocking. So I answered the door. I opened it up. like I said, what? They said, we come to tell you. And they started backing off of it. Tell you about, you don't want to go to hell. They were changing our whole story because I must have looked like, you know, the fires of flames coming on. Anyway, uh, I told them, and this is my quote, and God for, forgive, but look at, look at me now. I said, hell, I'm already in hell. Get off my porch, you know. And they just backed off so calmly, but, you know, like you see a dog back off, you know, like that. Poor, you know what? I bet you they prayed for me. Look at me now. So don't let anybody and their attitude push you around. Just take it with a grain of salt because remember the words that you speak are God's words and they don't return to God void. So even if they say they don't, say they won't, you just share as much God into them as you can because somebody will plant, somebody will come along and water it and then God will cause it to grow in them. And they'll never, ever begin, begin to forget the words that you've shared with them. Hello? They won't forget them. God won't let them forget them. Say amen. Another thing, too, is on the day that we stand before the Lord, we shall be rewarded for the things that we have done. We shall hear either well done, good and faithful servant, or we won't hear much at all. Now laugh with me a little bit, because this is our report card. So how do you get a good report card? Make sure you walk in love, present yourself to God every day so he can help you to walk, and just be kind and good, do good works. Don't go out there and try to do it all yourself. Just do it as it goes and flows. Enjoy your life and give him lots of praise and love. You're going to score very high. You don't have to go out there and evangelize and knock on seven doors a week and no, we're not talking about that. We're talking about how you love God. And as you grow, you'll love him more and more and more. We're not going to put you under a burden, but you will get a report card. So know that you want to go for A's. Now, if you don't get A's, you'll get B's. You don't have to always hit the high mark, but if you go for the high mark, you might be surprised how far you went. Say amen, somebody. So we always have a tendency to look at our own abilities. Remember who lives in you. It's he that's leading you. It's he that will give you high marks. Hello? All right, point two. We need to live and walk in the spirit. Can you say amen? Oh, I forgot number two. Give Jesus away to those who are lost. My page turned on its own. How does it do that? I don't know. Give Jesus away to those who are lost. Now, it's just a simple thing, right? Well, your children might be a little harder. I, I had to share with my mom and dad. And my mom and dad were good people. They, they weren't saved. My mom had a Methodist background, but she made moonshine <laughs> and alcohol and, and all kinds of stuff. And she was quite a person, Methodist background. And so one of the greatest things, that I, honor that I had is I led my mother and father to the Lord. How did I do that? Well, I don't really know how. I know I just let Jesus out. Just let Jesus out. So I showed up one day after I got saved. And I said, Mom and Dad, I got saved. And they both look at me like, what's that? I says, I got Jesus in my heart. And then they kind of laughed. They'll say, he'll get over that too, you know. And not only that, but... How come we don't ever pray over our meals when we're together? I start asking all these silly questions without wisdom. 
And my dad says, we pray over our meals. Well, he knew better. Well, make a long story short, I would just share little seats with them and come by and water them. And then I said, will you guys come on up this Christmas? We're going to just sit around. He's going to play his guitar and sing some Christmas carols and, and worship a little bit. Come on on up. And they showed up. And there is my mom and dad, and we're a whole room full of Christians. And we're singing uh, gospel songs. Remember, you have the upper hand. Don't let the room tell you. You tell the room who Jesus is. Take command. Take authority. And so we did. And then we made the mistake of, Sherry, grabbing hands and praying in a circle. And so I let off the prayer, oh, Lord, I just thank you that all of us, Lord, want to know you. We want to know you so much. And we just thank you that we can be family together. I'm just praying a general prayer. My dad starts weeping and crying. You know, and, and he looked at me and he says, do you think Jesus can heal my, my stomach ulcer? And you think he wants somebody like me? And I says, oh, daddy, wait, come on up here. So I grabbed him by the hand, prayed him through. He fell on the floor. Power of God hit him so strong. He was slain in the spirit, fell right on the floor. Now, my mother, being a good Methodist, she's screaming, don't hurt him, don't hurt him. I said, mom, Jesus will never hurt anybody. He's being filled and being saved. And not only that, but my dad changed drastically. He wasn't a bad man at the beginning, but now he was a saint, saint dad. And then it took six months later, then my mom finally got saved. And she says, every time you come over, you would share Jesus. Just share a little Jesus with me. And I would get frustrated and every I talk with dad and he shared Jesus with me. She ended up giving her heart to the Lord. So I was very, very much used by God. So don't limit yourself. I mean, you might be just who God uses. So keep sharing Jesus. Can you say amen? All right. In Matthew 23, oh, excuse me, Matthew 28, verse 18 through 20. Listen to the authority we have. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and in so that tells you right there the devil doesn't have any authority. And the only authority he can get is talking you out of yours by conning and deceiving. How much does Jesus have? All. Authority in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples, students of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. This means they get born again. And to baptize, just take the mystery out of that, means to immerse them in, to immerse them in, to train them, disciple them, immerse them into knowledge of God. And then dunk them in water. Can you say amen? Because if you just take a person and dunk them in water, you're dedicating them. You're not really baptizing them. They have to know a little bit about Jesus, a little bit. Then, then you baptize them because they know about the Lord. Then they're being immersed in Jesus. Then it's a follow through. Say amen. But if you take a little child and you just dab them or, or do that, that's a dedication. And that's good. It's accepted by God. After all, you don't want to throw a little infant in the pool. <laughs> Come on, laugh with me. Right, Michael got it. So I want to share with you, God has made the way. His name is Jesus. Amen? So, okay, in Acts chapter 1, now listen to this one. Matthew 28 says Jesus has all authority. We have Jesus in our heart. Listen to what Acts chapter 1 tells as Jesus is speaking, verse 4 through 8. Now there's some hidden truths here I think the church needs to listen to. I'll bring them out. And it being assembled together, the disciples, with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem. You hang out here, guys. But to wait for the promise of the Father. That was the Holy Spirit and the new covenant. Which he says, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized, immerses you in water. Uh, um, but you shall be baptized, immersed into the Holy Spirit, not many days from now. Therefore... When they had come together, they asked him, saying, now this is just typical human interest. 
But look at how Jesus answered them. I think we need to pay attention today because too many people are wondering when Jesus is coming and not winning souls. Listen to what Jesus said and make it, take it to heart. Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Verse 7, and he said to them, it's not for you to know the times or the seasons which the fathers put in his own authority. In other words, don't let that concern you so much. You get her after sharing Jesus. He's going to say that in just a minute. They asked him, Jewish people are always looking for a sign. They're always looking for some kind of confirmation. And I understand that. I'm not putting them down. But now we're in the New Testament. We have God in us. Our job is not to be wondering why the world is such a wreck. Our job is to be after God in prayer, praying for our kids, our families, praying for where we live in at least 20 miles in circumference square from Jerusalem to Dia, Samaria to the outer parts of other, other most parts of the world. It's a wagon wheel. You start from you, family out. Say amen. And don't exclude God's family. And he says, but you, I want you to focus on the power, boys, he said. Disciples, believers in God, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses, one who can prove, examine, and display. They'll be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So God wants you to reach out. Say amen. Instead of being caught up when Jesus is coming, it's good and it's important. But if that's all we're caught up, then we're looking somewhere else instead of looking to reach people from the, for the Lord. Say amen. We have talents and gifts. Every human being has talents. Some people can play music. Some people can write. Some people can talk. I have the gift of gab. Amen. And then they have gifts. Gifts are things given you. There's physical and spiritual. So let me explain. When you read the parable of the talents, you're talking about e life and eternal life in Christ. Everyone got the same mina. But when you go over to the gifts, one got 10, one got five, and one got one. Each one according to their several abilities. These are gifts. So let me ask you, what is the greatest gift that you have been given? Jesus. Some might say, I was given life. Yes, but after that, Jesus, because he gives you life back. Can you say amen? So what should be your treasure? Jesus. No matter what anyone says, why? Because you know all your hope and substance comes from him. So your gifts are given. So guess what? To some, you've got a certain calling. You have 10, talent, 10 gifts. To another, he has a lesser calling, but still never mind, still important, has five. Everyone according to their ability to administer it. Some people, they don't have much, but remember, it's according to their ability to minister it. God doesn't look on what people have or have not. He looks and he doesn't value us on what we have and have not. He values on what he originally gave us, the gift of life and what we're going to do with it. Say amen. Just simple. So we have Jesus now and he can help us live our life to the fullest, give God the glory and enjoy God's benefits. You know there's benefits? Sure. At the end though, if you don't learn to get everything kind of focused where God can make us fruitful, then we, want, we, we don't have, want to have D's and D minuses on our report card. Because we never bothered to try. We always thought our problems were so big. We just never could do quite that. Who's on your mind? You. 
It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And my father said, oh, Carrie, oh Lord, why are you complaining so much? When we pray, don't complain, don't fill God in. He knows everything. Begin to claim the scripture, begin to claim what's there, begin to say, Lord, you said that this is mine, this is mine. Help me to walk in it. Say amen. And by the way, when you're visiting with God, have him fix your soul a little bit and make it better. Let's go to our next, part, our next uh, scripture. I don't want to keep you too long. Life, live, walk in the spirit. Can you say amen? Now, we've covered this a lot in our home Bible study, if you ever get a chance to come. We hope to begin to tape those, but I'm not too good sitting on a one-on-one -on -one kind of thing with a camera. I mean, I mean it, it just takes some getting used to. Live and walk in the Spirit. Galatians chapter 5, you all know this one. Verse 16 through 18 tells us how to do it. Paul says, I say then, what should you do? Now, if you read the chapters ahead, they're going all through problems and situations. Paul is trying to teach him how to get into a realm where you're not suffering so much of these things. So says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the desires of your flesh. In other words, the more you're in the spirit, the less your flesh is complaining and, and lusting and being distracted. So the more you can be with God, the better off you're going to be. Walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh, your, your body lusts against the spirit. I don't want to pray. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to get up. I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to. For the flesh wars against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh, but these are contrary or against one another. See, that's Satan's realm. He likes to get one to go against another. Contrary, contrary. He feeds on that like some kind of vampire. Contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. In other words, Christians will be stopped if they don't learn how to walk in the spirit. Because Satan has blocks. And the natural man can't see what he's doing. But the spiritual man, God tips us off. Jesus leads the way. He bulwarks right through anything that Satan would set up. That's why we walk behind Jesus, not in front of him. And by the way, it's great to hold Jesus' hand, but it's best to follow what he tells you. Then it says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. You find that law in Romans 8, 2. That's the law of sin and death. That's what Adam gave us. Adam threw the human race into death and into sin. But Jesus said, if you come unto me, I'll cleanse you from your sin. I'll deliver you. I'll break the curse off of you. But you've got to stay consistent and abide in me. That's the key. And nowadays, I've never seen so many distractions. Wow, they're out there. And just the devil saying, looky, looky at me. Looky, 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 looky. Let me get your attention. Look, you're so caught up in other people's problems, you can't even pray. Looky, 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 deceivey, deceivey. Terrible. God had to really teach me about a lot of this stuff. And I have some great stuff to share with you, okay? But the fruit of the Spirit, that's what you have in you, is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, uh, long suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, law of sin and death. And those that are Christ have learned to crucify their flesh. Father, I lay my flesh down, crucify it, so that when I leave my prayer closet and go out into the world, I'll bring the spiritual end of it, and the dead part will stay right there. Folks, when you wear your clothes... After you wear them, you do what with them? You wash them, hopefully, so you're clean. Every day you go in and get the 
flesh clothing, your tent, washed. Without doing that, then sin will rise up and you'll begin to become deceiving of yourself. You'll feel like, what is wrong with me? And some of you been there. God doesn't want you there. He wants you growing up his way. Say amen. And he's a master at it. Let us become. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Spiritual life is just who we are. Say amen. It isn't hard. It's not a spiritual exercise. You get up, meet with God. You're in the spirit. Father, in Jesus' name, you're in the spirit. Now, being in the spirit means you are focused on what God is doing more than anything else. How do I do that? Well, see, sometimes we got a religious idea what that is. You could be brushing your teeth in the morning and be thinking about God. You could be doing your routine as a nurse or a, a laborer and think about God. And if I could encourage you, talk to him throughout the day. Hey, Lord, is this you and me? Look, at, I, I need some help with this. And just out loud, talk to God. Stop this mind praying. There's nowhere in Scripture you can find where the Bible says pray in your mind. Hello? There's not in there. Because it says confess with your mouth. So when you confess in Jesus' name, you're instilling the covenant and you're backing Satan away. When you just go on your mind, yes, God can hear you. But there's no established authority because you're not speaking. Do you get it? Pray, pray, speaking, asking. Even if you feel you can't talk well, just ask because you know what's coming out of your heart. Hello. But without that, Satan's got people, let's offer a silent prayer. <laughs> How many times have some of you in, in your background heard that? And where is that in scripture, by the way? It's not. It's called meditation. So learn to pray so that the power of God comes out of your mouth. Got it? Say, I got it. Sword of the Spirit. Lightsaber. Speak the word. So you have this. Now listen, there's a real problem with Christians sometimes. Because after we get some victory under our belt and some great things and our lives turned around, we get conceited. We can get full of ourselves and talk down to others. I try not to do that here. It's easy for a preacher to, 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 to speak at people and talk down to them. Never. In preaching, you talk up, hope, excitement. Go after it this way, and then you catch it. You see, it's, you have to catch it, pull it to you, and that truth by the Holy Spirit will walk you through it. But if you're not here even paying attention, just kind of let your mind drift in, then you, you're not going to catch much. It's going to be like rain washing off your back. So you want to make sure you catch every little dew drop. And when you get some good preaching or listen to a radio program. You're watching some, some other minister and stuff, and they're preaching really well. You take notes, and you get that stuff inside of you because that's Jesus. The word and Jesus are the same. One's in written form. One's in living form. But the more word you get in you, the more God grows in you. Say amen. And remember, don't just intellectually study. Apply your heart, Lord, those four ways. Historical, whom, to whom it is referring to, and its context, and how does it apply to me? All right, so let's go on. My next point, we belong to Christ. Say amen. So we're in Jesus. If we're in Jesus, then that's quite a place to be. Fully protected. Well, let me ask you something. If you're in Christ and caught up in Christ, there's no way you're thinking about sinning. You're caught up in Christ. To be absent from the body, be caught up in Christ, you see. But the idea is God wants us to know that we can be caught up with God and still be human-ish to others and, and still enjoy life to its fullness. Why? Because by doing that, the light of God comes out and 
Satan is darkness. And what does darkness do when the light comes to it? It runs. So don't be unwise. So the enemy is pulling some pressure on you to start worshiping, thanking God, and let the brightness of the light shine, and the enemy will back away. He'll still be rolling around your head. You've got to rebuke it. But he'll back away. Why? Because he cannot stand the light. And there's a light that emanates from all of us because of Jesus you can't see. And only rarely can you see the Shekinah glory. But there's a light that emanates from you. I said to my brother the other day, I said, man, that's a great haircut that you got. Well, he doesn't have any hair. He shaves his head. But what I saw in him is a brightness coming out of him. A light shining on him. It looked like he's a new man. Well, you can have that every day, folks. And if you are having that, you can increase that. God is saying, we're barely scratching the surface. So learn the ways of Jesus. Learn how Jesus did it. He wasn't stressed even when the enemy came right to his face. Learn to die out to the things that affect you, to live on to God, and God will heal up any of those areas and take them from you if you stay consistent. Say amen. All right, done preach myself happy. We belong to Christ and are set apart for him. Now, this is a hard one, but I think the church needs to sober up, sober up and look at this, generally speaking. Now, the people that are praying, the people that are winning souls and touching lives, I'm not talking about those. I'm talking about the people that are sitting home, waiting for Jesus, not applying the word, Oh, God bless me and help me. And I'm not putting anybody down, but they don't do anything. They're like leaves with no fruit. Hello, God wants fruit on our branches. Say amen. He wants us involved in hearing and doing, hearing and doing. Not over-involved because you're busy, but involved enough where everything is fresh. When the water is rolling down the stream, it always cleanses itself. When the water sits, it'll stay clean for a day or two, and you'll get pollywogs. It could be the sweetest water in the world. Just let it sit out in the open. No, water needs to move, and you're filled with the living water of God. Say amen. So listen what he says. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, 2 and 3 says, For I am jealous for you with a godly jealous, jealousy. He, went, he got the church with Apollos and started in, I got the hiccups, started in Corinth. So they got the church started. Paul went in, planned the church, put the pastors there, okay, and then gave them to God. So this is where we're going to take it up. He gave this Corinthian church to God. Be like giving CCM to God. For I am jealous, he says, for you with godly jealousy. For I have betrothed or married you to one husband, Jesus that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, everyone thinks of virgin. Don't think naturally. Virgin means your heart's pure to him. Every day you start out with a pure heart with him because you meet with him. Pure heart, you're his virgin. Get to thinking new life in Christ instead of old life hanging around. <laughs> Say amen. And he says... But I fear lest someone or somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds, notice he didn't say anything else, your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity in Christ Jesus. Folks, the gospel is simple. Make sure you're born again. Make sure you walk with God. Make sure you ask forgiveness if you have any ought. Make sure that you forgive others and share Jesus. That's how simple it is. Make sure you walk with Jesus and he'll guide your life. But it's when we're caught up in all the affairs of life and we're doing all that, this is when we get entangled in the lies and the deceptions of the enemy. Don't be moved away. Everyone's tempted when they're drawn away by their own lusts or desires. Drawn away from what? You walk with God. You walk in the spirit. Don't be drawn away. How long does it take you? Now listen, I have this little joke. From, from your prayer life, getting up in the morning, making sure you pray to God before you go to work. And it doesn't have to be long. 
and you set yourself, it's kind of like getting reset. How long does it take for that nice, sweet, spiritual person to drain out through the day and suddenly become the old person again? Well, some people, it's almost immediately. They lose their salvation, get mad at somebody right out in the parking lot. So there's a transition of growth. So when you get up from your prayer and you follow Jesus, remember, be quick to hear and slow to speak. Why? Because then anger or frustration or distraction won't get a hold of you. Say amen. Woohoo! Good preaching, Carrie. I'm the only one thanking myself. I'm my own best friend. All right, let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Now look at this one, 14 through 18. This is talking about if you're going to hang around friends, they have to be as spiritual as you or unless you're ministering to them. But if you just, now I'm not talking about work partners. I'm, not, I'm talking about where you hang out. I used to know some Christians that they couldn't find any place to go. So we made a Christian uh, nightclub and restaurant years ago. And, but they would go out to the bars and they wouldn't drink, but they sit and listen to the rock bands and everything. That is not what God wants you to take your fellowship from. Because those, believe, believe it or not, I'm sure they were, are good people. But people that are not saved, they have spooks. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. They have demons and spooks, not in them, but around them. So listen, if you're going to go visit your friends and you know they're kind of weird, you're not going to choose to hang out too long. But you are going to bind those demons and spooks that they have so that when you are there, you can get Jesus in their heart. Be smart. You are a missionary. You are an ambassador everywhere you go, even if it's Safeway. I've led, I don't know how many people to the Lord in Safeway. Because my first mission is to reach others for God, not think about my problems. Say, oh, me. It's quiet in here. <laughs> oh, I love you guys. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Don't hang out with them. For what fellowship has righteousness, that's you, with unrighteousness, people that don't obey God? And what communion, all right, what real intimacy has light with darkness? It doesn't have any. And what accord has Christ with Beal? Beal is another name for Satan. They just changed the name in a different language and they kept it as Beal in the Bible. Beelzebub. Many had different names for the devil. With Beal. As I have said, what agreement has the temple of God, which temple you are, with idols? For you are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will dwell in them. Is he dwelling in you? Say amen. And I will walk among them. In other words, he's leading us. Oh, man, you guys got to get to loving that. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, get this truth above a lot of stuff. When you see a therefore, it's therefore the previous statement. Therefore, come out from among them. Yes, you have to work with them. Yes, you can be friends to an extent, but you don't have to do what they do. Say amen. You don't have to talk like they talk. They know not God, for they talk like the world, and the world hears them, Jesus said. But you'll talk like God, and the world will not hear you. For they love their darkness and sin more than they love the light. So remember these things. Don't be freaked out about them. Go out there and win souls, touch lives. Say amen. amen. How do I do that? I don't know much word. Tell them what Jesus is doing for you. Keep it simple. Just share. Jesus did this for me. He healed me of this. I, I want to tell you even everything, all the clothes that I have, Jesus provided them for me. He got me in my house. You start sharing like that, and now it's personal. Don't overshare, but a great way to win people to the Lord. Would you like this, Jesus? I guess I would. Well, pray with me. See, you didn't confront them. 
you beckon them in. Make the world feel like they have nothing but want what you have. How do I do that? You can't. God does it through you. Did Jesus have any problem touching lives? Who do you have in you? The same Jesus. Let him out. Learn to let Jesus out. Most Christians don't know how to do it. The old Pentecostals, they stumbled on it. And some of the charismatic movements. But then it wasn't taught and people didn't want to learn. And the church has fallen in the darkness the last 20 years. We're bickering amongst ourselves. We're divided up. And that should never be. We're only one body. One body. Doesn't say many bodies. Many labels, but one body. So my sister up the street might not want to be close to me because I belong to this body while she's over there. You see, carnal, carnal. Read 1 Corinthians 3, it'll tell you. You are carnal. You're in division because you haven't seen the bigger picture. See it. Say amen. Therefore, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing. We talked about this a little while ago. There are certain people that think certain things are unclean, and certain other people, that, that doesn't bother them at all. Now, what do you say about that, Pastor? If you believe something's unclean, stay away from it, because it, to you it is. But don't preach what you think's unclean to others. Because somebody might not be able, like I, I shared, go to a beach. I can't go to the beach because there's all these pretty women all lust after them. Well, see, he hasn't dealt with his lust. Hello? Can't go to church without seeking out a single woman or a single man. <laughs> <laughs> That's where the broken people are. Don't marry a broken person. We to get fixed for us, observe them, see the fruit from their life. And then when you date, ask every kind of question you can imagine. And then go to your elders and ask, please pray for me. Because that's one of the greatest decisions you need to discern is about your life. Come on. All right, and we'll be finishing with you. Come out from among them. So anything can be clean. For some people, they don't touch alcohol. And I think that's a good thing. Personally, I don't. I used to drink, but I don't drink anymore because I found I'm not myself. And if you look up the history on it, nothing ever could be made alcohol until Adam and Eve sinned. So it's liquid rot made into a little chemical that changes the thinking of your mind. It's called pharmakia or sorcery. Satan included alcohol in his fallenness to change your mind so you let down your guard and you can be taken advantage of. Another deception. So, listen, I don't condone drinking, but if you want to have a beer, that, that's up between you and God, okay? But I can't condone you doing that because eventually God will go, I want you to stop that now. And why would he do that? Because he's bringing you into a better place with him, and he's got to clean you up along the way. Lay aside the weight and the sin so easily besets us. Lay aside those things and pursue Jesus. So he helps us with those things. Can you say amen? So anything that's unclean to you is unclean to you. Stay away from it because God put a conviction in your heart. But if it's not unclean to someone else, don't tell them, you better not touch that. God told me that was good. That's completely, you do that, you're, you're in error. You're in error. Well, Jesus drank wine, no. He was a Nazarite. He drank grape juice, and grape juice all the way up to vinegar. It was all called wine. The good wine was grape juice. The, the next not so good was the, the wine that got set out a day and started to ferment. And then the third day, not so, not so good. So the people at the wedding, they gave the cheap wine, and it was fermented. And then when Jesus... Hey, they ran out of wine, and Jesus' mom said, hey, turn the, you know, do something. And so he changed the water into wine. He didn't make booze. He was a Nazarite. Nazarites cannot drink or even look on wine. He made grape juice. And that's why everyone said, boy, this is the best wine I've ever had. Why did you keep the good wine for later? Oh, I don't know, Pastor. Look it up. 
I did it for you, but look it up. Because it also says if you look on the wine when it moves itself in the glass, woe to the man that sits at the wine all day long. He's a raging failure, alcoholic. I mean, it's all through the word. So don't let compromise get into your tank. You're living in Jesus, right? So the enemy says, well, I can't get them out of Jesus, so I'll get compromise into their walk. So God really wants us to come out from the compromising areas of our life. It could be as much as overeating. You know, maybe believing gullible things. It could be anything. But he wants us to come away from that because it's not good exposure. Say amen. And it says be careful of our friends because whoever you associate yourself with, they're going to believe you're just like them. So be careful. Your testimony is very important that you be respected when you talk. Hello? Moving right along. It will be, a, and he says, if you do these things, I will receive you, and I will be a father to you. Now, I'm going to say this, it's, it's kind of sting a little bit, but generally speaking, the only ones I know that are letting God be a father to them are the ones you can see the fruit in their life. There's a lot of what I call professors of Christianity, and they love God. But they're not a doer. They're not, they don't pray. They don't get with God like they should. So there's no real fruit. It seems like they're always going through a disaster. Their life's always trashed. Come on now, I'm talking to you. Now, I'm not referring to you. But you see, you're supposed to be sharing God with them. Give them some hope. Give them some Jesus. And tell them. First thing they're going to relate to is, you know, I tried that religious stuff. Look at them and say, this has nothing to do with religion. This is as if, and you might say this, you can borrow it from me. This is as if we all were poisoned and we have a curse that's going to make us die and suffer. You come up to them and you say, you know, we all are cursed. We're going to be, we're suffering. Your life is suffering. Would you like to have the cure? And related to COVID, would you like the vaccine? Related to where they're at. Your life is a mess. I'm not here to preach a religion. I'm here to give you the vaccine. Preach heart to heart, face to face when you share. Make sure you pull them out and find out where they're at. You just have to listen to a person five or, or six minutes, and you'll, they'll locate themselves of where they're not and where they're at, and you'll be able to minister to them, at least through prayer. Say amen. We are ambassadors for Christ. We have the goods. Our job is to reach the lost. Our job is to lay hands on the sick. Our job is to cast away devils. And if we don't do it, the enemy is going to rush in. When the light is dimming, darkness comes close. When your light is bright, every day meeting with God, just, just get in, in hilariously full of God. The light's so bright, Satan can't even hardly approach you. He has to send someone. This is my last point. I, I, I pray. I know that if I stay in the tank and pray and do what God asked me to do, that I'm going to appear very bright, for you are the light of the world. That means Satan sees this light. This light isn't for humans to see. It's for him to be warned off. Now, you might not have ever known that. So what the enemy's done is kept people from prayer so they don't stay bright. Because if you're bright, even though your life is not together, listen, if you're so bright, Satan can't look at you. And even though inside of you, you're not quite together, he won't be able to see that. You work on shining for God and sharing Jesus and watch your life spin right around, your health come back like the eagles, and watch God begin to do miracles in your life. Now, if you got something out of that, we get ready to close.